Good evening. My name is Karl Niaus and tonight I'm going to deliver a lecture on whether General Constant Fuljun really contributed to a peaceful transition to democracy in South Africa. Or did he blackmail President Mandela into making compromises that up to today still impede the radical economic transformation of our country? I want to thank the ANC Youth League in Greater Tswane Region for co-hosting this Facebook lecture together with our Radical Economic Transformation Facebook group. On Friday, the 3rd of April, General Constant Fuljun, the former Chief of the South African Defence Force, the Defence Force of the old Apartheid Regime, and founder leader of the Freedom Front, which later became known as the Freedom Front Plus, passed away. In expressing his condolences to General Fulyun's wife, Risti, and his family, President Ramaphosa said that he will be remembered for influencing conservative movements into abandoning plans for military resistance to the democratic transition. President Ramaphosa described General Fulyun's principal contribution as his success in demobilizing conservative resistance to the negotiated transition in our country at a critical point in our history. In this assessment of a small part of General Fulyun's long and rather controversial life, President Ramaphosa is not wrong. As someone who engaged with General Fulyun and observed how he conducted himself from close up during the critical months before our first democratic elections on the 27th of April 1994, I can confirm that some of the last minute decisions that he took helped to smooth the path to successful implementation of our negotiated settlement. However, recalling that critical period in the painful and convulsive labor that preceded the birth of our imperfect democracy, I do not think that this is all that we should remember about General Fulian, nor that his conduct during a short moment in history no matter how critical it may have been, ultimately defines the character of the man. The critical question is, with what motive did he do so? Not many people outside the confines of Afrikanerdom knows that General Fulyun was one of twins. His identical twin brother, Brown Fulyun, Professor Brown Fulyun, is a theologian and he lectured for years church history at the University of South Africa. When I was a political prisoner in the Pretoria Maximum Prison and studied theology as a correspondence student, Brown Fulyun was one of my lecturers. In the thoughtful and progressive responses that Brown Fulyun gave to my assignments, it became clear to me that it was only in their physical appearances that the two Fulyun twins resembled each other at all. Politically, they were miles apart. While Constant worked his way up the ranks of the South African Defence Force to ultimately become the most senior apartheid general and chief of the SADF, Brown, the theologian, became increasingly critical of apartheid. And by the time he was my lecturer, he had already totally rejected it and was a supporter of the liberation struggle and of the African National Congress. Through the ideas that we shared in the correspondence between lecturer and student, we encouraged each other and shared our theological condemnation of the Dutch Reformed Church's so-called theology of apartheid. 
When I was eventually released from prison, it was the most natural thing for us to meet and to become friends. I found in Brahm a thoughtful interlocutor, who while fully supportive of the non-racial democracy that we and the ANC were striving to establish, had enough engagement with the leadership elite of the Afrikaans community to interpret for me their thinking and what their real intentions were. His interpretations of their thinking and especially the intelligence that he shared with me about what his brother was up to was invaluable. Although Brahm and Constant did not see eye to eye politically, their shared brotherly love never wavered. And I observed the special link and the rapport that so often exists between identical twins. Constance shared his innermost thoughts with Brown, and no doubt also used Brown's closeness to the ANC to understand the strategies and intentions of the ANC leadership better. It was a situation where a unique set of extraordinary circumstances made the personal political and the political person. Thus, when I was told by an extremely concerned Brown during one of our regular lunches at the UNISA cafeteria, that Constant was ready, together with a number of generals in the SADF, to commit a coup and to derail the negotiations that were at a very delicate stage, I knew that I had to take what he was telling me very seriously. The ANC's own intelligence already also alerted us that such a move was afoot. But Brown's confirmation of this based on personal conversations that he had with his brother indicated that the coup plans were far more advanced and imminent to be carried out than what we actually thought. It was a looming crisis that could derail everything that we were working towards. Brown was convinced that the only thing that could stop Constant from proceeding with his plans would be a meeting with President Nelson Mandela. To set up such a meeting was no simple matter. For Jung was one of the most impeccable and sworn enemies of the ANC, a notoriously aggressive apartheid general who had been in the forefront of the war against the ANC and our allies in Namibia and Angola. Know as a general who leads his soldiers from the front on the battlefield, he was personally involved in the occupation of Namibia and led the charge of the SADF into Angola. When the SADF invaded Angola, there was on the front pages of every South African newspaper a photo of him in full battle camouflage standing on top of the first tank that crossed the Angolan border, pointing north towards Luanda. He proudly saw himself as being part of a long lineage of Boer generals. His hands were not only figuratively, but literally dripping with the blood of our comrades. I shared with Brown that I would tried to convince Madiba to meet with Fulyun. And when I told Madiba about Brown's concerns, he initially was reluctant to meet, but asked Comrade Tabu and Beki for his opinion. Comrade Tabu already had a few secret meetings with General Fulyun, which was facilitated by a certain Professor Willy Estreus, a professor in political philosophy at the University of Stellenbosch with whom he had struck up a friendship. Eventually, it was decided that the meeting with General Fulyun was worth the risk, and that a direct personal engagement between the two of them may convince Fulyun not to proceed with his coup plans. I contacted Brahm and informed him that President Mandela was prepared to meet with his brother. We relied on his close relationship with his brother to convince him to agree to the meeting. In this, Brown succeeded. 
The first meeting was a tense affair. Madiba brought Comrade Joe Mudise, the commander of Umkonto Visizwe, and General Fulyun brought with him General Tini Grunewald. We were meeting with someone who was in posture, evidently ready for war. Madiba and General Fulyun entered the meeting room from separate doors, and as they shook hands and started talking, they kept on standing, facing each other. With his characteristic astute courtesy, Madiba kept quiet after the initial exchange of polite greetings and allowed General Fulyun to talk first. Fulyun referred to the secret meetings that he had with Comrade Tabo and complained that he felt that the ANC was not sufficiently sympathetic to the idea of Afrikaner self-determination, the protection of minorities and the folk start. He was upset that the negotiations between the ANC and the National Party of F.W. de Klerk, for whom he claimed to have no time or respect, sidelined the right-wing Afrikaner political groupings, whom he referred to as the real Afrikaners. The concept of sufficient consensus to take decisions during negotiations that was developed between Comrade Cyril Ramaphosa and the Clark's main negotiator, Rolf Meyer, was anathema to him. Because according to Fulyun, it reduced the negotiations to an ANC and National Party affair. He said it was a predetermined conclusion that this decision-making process would lead to a unitary state that he and his people, as he called them, would never accept. Because, according to him, it threatened the future existence of the Afrikaner nation. For Jung concluded with an ominous threat that he and a number of SADF generals had a carefully worked out coup plan that would put an end to the negotiations and democratic elections, which he described as irri nonsense, this nonsense. Figuratively, General Fuyun had cocked the equivalent of an R1 automatic rifle and was holding it against President Mandela's head. At this point, Madiba, always the courteous gentleman, pointed towards the chairs and suggested they sit down. Only after tea and coffee was served did Madiba start talking slowly and very deliberately. He first thanked Fulyun for having agreed to meet, and then proceeded to address the threat of a coup. Turning to Comrade Joe Mudisi, he said that he knows that Comrade Joe would not like to acknowledge it, but in a conventional battle with the SADF, the Liberation Army of the ANC, Umkontu Wisizwe, would not be able to prevail. To this, Comrade Mudisi did not respond but his almost always present frown only deepened. Madiba proceeded to say to Fulyun that if he is correct in what he was saying that he had the support of the SADF, he would probably be able to pull off a successful coup and stop the negotiating process. Having conceded this, he then asked Fulyun what he thought would happen the day after the coup. Without waiting for an answer, Madiba described to Fulyun how MK would resume guerrilla warfare and sabotage attacks against the Boer government that he intended to install. The international community would totally isolate such a regime and resume even harsher international sanctions that would destroy the South African economy that was already on the brink of collapse burdened by a huge and unmanageable international debt. Having sketched this devastating scenario, Madiba paused and took a long sip on his tea. The atmosphere was heavy with tension and with anticipation. Fulyun sat with the stiff, upright demeanour of a military man. His face, expressions. Behind him, the growling face of General Grunewald, with his naturally red complexion, became red. Fulyun tried to interject, but Madiba lifted his hand 
and with a smile asked him to please give him a chance to conclude his thoughts. He then said to Fulion, General, both you and I are fathers, and we have children and grandchildren. Is the wasteland that South Africa will become when you proceed with your plans really the future that you want to bestow on your children? For you responded that this was not in his intention, but he felt that he had no other option because the legitimate concerns of his people were not being addressed. To this, Madiba replied that he was prepared to convince Fuyun to talk to the ANC and also convince the ANC to address those concerns that Fuyun had expressed. But then Fuyun must let go of his coup plans. Fuyun did not explicitly agree to stop his plotting of Horapu, but he agreed to start a process of engagement with the ANC which was to be led by Comrade Tabu Mbeki to address the issues that he had raised. In subsequent engagements with an ANC team that Comrade Tabu handpicked, and which among others included Comrade Steve Twete, Siti Mafumadi, and also intermittently Comrade Jacob Zuma, Fulyun and his coterie of right-wing generals and other Boer representatives pushed for the ANC to accept the idea of an Afrikaner folk start, a council of minorities, the protection of property rights, with specific reference to the property rights and farms of the Boers. This was a matter on which the two heads of the Transvaal and Free State Agricultural Unions, Dries Bruwer and Piet Goos, who were part of the Union's team of negotiators, absolutely insisted on. The sunset clauses, which was initially proposed by Comrade Tabu Mbeki, after discussions between him and his friend Professor Willy Esterhuizen, and popularized by Comrade Joe Slovo in the mainstream negotiations between the ANC and the National Party, was strongly pushed for by Fulyun because it created security of employment for Afrikaner civil servants far beyond the transition to a democratic state. It was also agreed that the integration process of the SADF and the South African police service and the Liberation Armies, which specifically and with specific reference to Mkontui Siswe and APLA, which became referred to as the non-statutory forces to establish the then new SADF and SAPS would not challenge or affect the rankings of the white officers in those forces, regardless of the fact that they were the loyal servants of apartheid. Furthermore, it was agreed that the criteria for integration and ranking would be the existing norms and qualifications of the conventional security forces. In securing this undertaking from the ANC, for Jung and his apartheid generals fully secured the rankings and positions of their own people and placed the members of the Liberation Armies at a huge disadvantage. What this resulted in was the absorption instead of the integration of our liberation fighters into the new South African Defence Force and South African Police Service under the control of the old apartheid officers. This resulted in the absorption into the unreconstructed command structures of the old SADF and SAPs that remained in place. It was hugely disrespectful to our liberation fighters and caused untold humiliation and suffering to them. This was one of the greatest travesties of the negotiations and is a problem that continues to haunt us until this very day. For you and the apartheid generals, both in the SADF and in SAPS, with specific reference to the security police and the notorious Dev Squad units and the Ascaris of Flakplas and elsewhere, 
were insistent that an amnesty process had to be agreed to before they would shelf their coup plans. The then head of the South African Defence Force, General Jan Geldenhuis, made it clear that he would only support the outcome of the negotiations and allow the planned elections for the 27th of April 1994 to go ahead if a process of amnesty was agreed for him and his fellow officers and soldiers. Thus, right at the end of the negotiating process, an amnesty process was indeed agreed to, which led to the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which had as its foundational principle the travesty that the so-called human rights violations that liberation fighters may have committed during the extremely difficult conditions of the liberation struggle against apartheid were treated simply as similar and equal to the atrocities of the South African police members and South African Defence Force soldiers, what they committed against the most un mostly unarmed and defenseless black people of South Africa while they were enforcing the crime against humanity that apartheid was. As a consequence, those white torturers and killers of our people mostly got off scot-free, while liberation heroes such as Mama Winnie Marikazela Mandela, who sacrificed their lives for our liberation, were humiliated and treated like criminals. What was agreed to with regards to the establishment and functioning of the Human Rights Commission, under the pressure of General Fulhun and his fellow coup plotters, was truly shameful and a travesty of justice. Up to this day, we have to live with the humiliation and shame that those white racist monsters who tortured, maimed and killed our fathers, mothers and children are arrogantly and with impunity going about their business among us. Recently, I felt the deep pain of this person when a certain warrant officer, Nick Dietlifs of the security police, denied that he had tortured me when I was in 1983 in detention and held in solitary confinement at Old Foster Square. He even called me a liar and smugly said, that he only slapped me around. <laughs> this he did apparently without fear for any consequences, while it is known that he was involved in the interrogation sessions and torture of Comrade Neil Abbott that led to him having been killed in detention. All of this and more protections of the apartheid criminals some of which remain secret up to this very day, had been extracted under the threat of a planned right-wing coup. The critical question must be asked if there was behind the scenes not collaboration between the plotters of the coup and the Clark's National Party negotiators to use this coup threat as a negotiating tool, while on the surface they denied that they had anything to do with it and also claimed to feel under pressure and threatened by it. For the sake of fully understanding our history and how we reach the situation that we are in now, it is important that the truth and the full truth must be unearthed. However, what we do know is that one of the most important so-called facilitators of the negotiations with Phil Yun and his coup plotters was Professor Willy Esterhuizen, that close friend of Comrade Tabu Mbeki, who once declared that he would entrust his life into the hands of Comrade Tabu. One wonders, and one can only wonder, what infused such trust. What we do actually know is that Professor Esterhuizen had very close links with the Apartheid National Intelligence Service, NIS, and regularly participated in, de in debriefing sessions with them. There is a very strong likelihood that he was actually a member of NIS 
What we also know is that Professor Estreuser was a close friend of Dr. Wimpy de Klerk, the former editor of both the Transvala and Rapport, and older brother of F.W. de Klerk, as well as a close friend of a senior civil servant and NIS member Marius Sparwater, who was the right-hand man of the National Party chief negotiator, Rolf Meyer, during the negotiations. Now, one must be either naive or downright stupid not to connect the dots. General Fulhuren is on record to have told the Clark's predecessor, P.W. Boota, several times that there was no military solution to South Africa's problems and that a political solution had to be found before South Africa was forced to negotiate from a position of despair rather than strength. The general was actually not even that much opposed to black South Africans getting the vote. In a speech to the Bruderbond, he referred to blacks who served in the apartheid South African Defence Force and said, and I open quote, if they can fight for South Africa, they can vote for South Africa, I close quote. And in a 1981 briefing to Boota's cabinet, he said that a formula was needed, and I quote again, where all the people living in the country would feel involved and part of the country, close quote. This does not sound like someone who was ready to carry out a coup, does it? Nor does it sound like someone who was prepared to do everything possible to prevent black South Africans from voting. In his long but analytically sloppy article about for union the Sunday Times of the 5th of April, journalist Chris Barron refers to these comments by for union as a sign of some enlightenment from him. Well, I believe that that would be an erroneous conclusion and that something far more sinister was at play. For Yun was not so much concerned about preventing black South Africans from voting. He was far more concerned about securing the apartheid accumulated wealth and vast land ownership of whites, especially the farms, of his people. In order to extract guarantees for that, he was using the threat of a coup by the SADF to secure the required bargaining power. What the obstreperous and procrastinating P.W. Boota wasted in terms of a position of power and strength to negotiate with his stupid and disastrous Rubicon speech, for Jung tried to recuperate through the threat of a coup. General for Jung was not a somehow benevolent, misunderstood, nice Boer general at work. Here was the equivalent of a sly mafiosi using blackmail tactics. Sadly for the people of South Africa, he largely pulled off his cool bluff. With the wisdom of hindsight, and over time, Having looked at what happened and having had more access to the communications that transpired between Fulhun and the generals that he claimed were ready to join him in the coup, it emerged that there was far less enthusiasm from them for the coup than what he claimed. General George Mayer, who was then the head of the army, was not only unenthusiastic, but actually diametrically opposed to the idea. When Fulhun arrogantly told him, you and I and our men can take this country in one afternoon, Mayron retorted with, yes, Constant, but what do we do the next morning after the coup? Echoing the same argument that Madiba used in his meeting with Fulhun. Mayron then proceeded to warn Fulhun, we'll have to stop you. So Fulhun knew that a large part of the South African Defence Force was not going to support him, and that brother would be pitched 
against Prabhu. Mayron also proceeded to inform Madiba about what Fulyun said to him. Thus, when Madiba met with Fulyun, he also already had what Mayron told him in the back of his mind. Whether this helped Madiba to handle Fulyun, or whether it actually assisted Fulyun to make his cool threat more believable, it's difficult to say. But I think the latter is quite possible. What we do need to speculate, and do not need to speculate about, is that by the time General Fulyun met with Madiba, he knew that he did not have the support of the chief of the army, which in the event of pulling off a successful coup would have been absolutely essential. Thus, when Fulyun threatened Madiba during their meeting, he already knew that he was threatening something which was close to mission impossible. For you had another serious problem with fractures and ill-disciplined loose coalition of right-wingers that were supporting. For some of these racist right-wing loonies, even for you, was too much of a moderate and he was actually the target of an assassination plot by the Uramach paramilitary group who considered him to be a sellout. In this splintered support base of Fungun, his Achilles heel was Eugene Terreblanche and his Afrikaner Weerstandsbeweer, the AWB. In March 1994, there were fake news rumors that the ANC was going to overthrow the puppet homeland government of Lucas Mangope. Fulyun mobilized 4,000 men to rush to Mangope's assistance. Among this ragtag army were also the AWB Beer Belly Brigade, who went on a shooting spree against unarmed and helpless civilians in Mabatu. Fulyun tried to stop them, but he was simply ignored. They were given a bloody nose by members of the Bukuta Tswana Defence Force, who were outraged by their own people being killed and who were anyhow sympathetic to the ANC. Who can forget the TV footage of three of these AWB white trash being shot dead at point-blank range next to the clapped-out green old Mercedes by a member of the Bukuta Tswana Defence Force? The host whole so-called Mangope rescue expedition into the Bubutatswana homeland was a disaster. And Fulyun had to pull out, running with his tail between his legs. He blamed the AWB and called them chamors, rubbish. But actually, the writing was on the wall. How was Fulyun going to pull off a coup? if he could not even successfully carry out such a minor operation. Shortly after this disaster, he announced that he was forming the Freidstrand, the Freedom Front, and that he was going to participate in our first democratic elections on the 27th of April, 1994. Now, folklore has it that Foyun was seduced by Madiba to participate in the elections. And that was also the headline of the Sunday Times article by Chris Barron that I had already referred to. However, however, reality was far more mundane, but also sinister. The Bupatatswana Mangope rescue debate had exposed the emptiness of Olyun's coup threat. But by then it had served its purpose in having helped him to extract and secure property, rights, jobs and security and amnesty for whites as guarantees during the negotiations. Interestingly, the first person that Foyun informed that he was forming the Freedom Front and that he was going to participate in the elections was the Chief of the Army, General George Mayer, even before he informed President Nelson Mandela. As it turned out, Foljoen's Freedom Front managed to secure a meager 2.2% of the vote. I dare say that as the ANC 
we made major concessions and compromises that impacted in a long and lasting negative manner on the lives of millions of black South Africans. The real possibility of a coup that could have derailed the negotiations and elections could possibly have justified some of the compromises that were made. But as it turned out, the coup threat was more of a negotiating Sorry, there was an interruption. It is sad that 2.2% of white right-wing voters with a racist apartheid history extracted so much at the cost and continuing suffering of so many millions of black South Africans. It is true that the majority of whites voted for the Klax National Party in the 1994 elections and in subsequent elections for the Democratic Alliance. But if one considers the arrogance of the Klax's recent denial that apartheid was a crime against humanity and the manner in which Musi Mayamani was unceremoniously removed as the leader of the DA when he no longer towed the line of the white majority of members in the DA. The difference between all these whites is marginal and indeed negligible. If even if all of them are counted together, they are only a small fractional minority compared with the millions of black South Africans who deserve much better than what they have been experiencing over the past two and a half decades since the negotiated settlement was concluded and are continuing to experience also now. The negotiated compromises that greatly contributed to keeping the black majority of South Africans economically marginalized and secured amnesties and immunity of prosecution for the perpetrators of apartheid crimes were evidently not justified 27 years ago, and they were most certainly not justified now. Years later, in 1998, when I was South African ambassador in the Netherlands, I had a further rather revealing experience, which to my mind reveals the real character of General Fulhu. He was, as leader of the Freedom Front, visiting the Netherlands and before his arrival, President Mandela called me and asked me as ambassador to provide for you with all the support appropriate for a leader of a South African political party. I dutifully followed, followed his instructions and as a consequence found myself hosting a dinner party for General Fulhun and his wife Risti at the residence of the South African ambassador. During the conversation, they did not really want to flow and spurted along in stops and starts. I asked Fulhun what the ultimate intention of the South African Defence Force attack into Angola was. His answer startled me. He said the following, to get rid and right through to Luanda, to get rid of those MPLA communists and to put Savimbi in power. And we would have done exactly that if it was not for the verdomde Cubana, the damn Cubans. When he said this, his whole facial expression changed and his eyes turned hard, steel grey. It was clear that the defeat of the South African Defence Force at the Battle of Huitu Hanaval was still a very sore point for him. Chris Barron, in his Sunday Times article, claims that it was never Fulhun's intention to take Luanda and put a puppet government under Savimbi in power. I beg to differ. The general himself told me, in no uncertain terms, what his intentions were. When remembering the internationally illegal and vicious attack on Angola, we must also never forget the decades-long illegal occupation of Namibia and the terrible atrocities that the South African Defence Force committed 
against the civilian population of Namibia. In 1982, I was part of the South African Council of Churches fact-finding mission that visited Uvamboland and the Caprivi in the far north of Namibia. What we saw there was terror. I saw with my own eyes women who were raped and had their wombs cut out. Blinded people whose eyes were gorged out and many permanently crippled Namibians who lost limbs. One particularly harrowing case was of a woman whose both hands were boiled as part of interrogation to get her to reveal the whereabouts of her husband, who was a member of SWAPO. These atrocities, these terrible atrocities, were committed by the soldiers of the South African Defence Force, whom for Yun so proudly and in his swashbuckle style had led. There can be no doubt that for Yun was fully aware of these atrocities. And as the commanding officer of these soldiers had to take the ultimate responsibility. No doubt that is why he was so insistent on securing amnesty for himself and his soldiers. Was General Fulyun ever sorry for what he personally had done and for the terrible suffering that the apartheid system that he so ardently defended as the most senior general inflicted on black South Africans? I certainly don't think so. The last time I had anything to do with General Constant Fulyun was 20 years ago when I approached him to sign the Declaration of Acknowledgement of Guilt and for Restoration of the Home for All campaign. We asked white South Africans to acknowledge their guilt and to accept that they have all benefited from apartheid and must commit to pay restitution. Fulian's response was sobering. As much as it was revealing of the true defining character of the man. He responded that he had nothing to say sorry about and that he was indeed proud of what he had done to fight communism. I heard that shortly before his death, a journalist called him and asked him if, again if he had any regrets, and he gave the same answer. I have no regrets. I'm proud of what I've done. So, the general went unrepentant to his grave. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is what ultimately defines apartheid's last Boer general. He was a confident trickster and an unrepentant war criminal. That is the end of the lecture. I will provide the lecture and post it online as the full text. And if there are any one of you who now want to engage with me and send written questions that I can respond to, you are most welcome to do so. I thank all of you who are prepared to listen to this lecture. Thank you.